Hello, and welcome to the 16th episode of our Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe read-through. I'm Jem, the reader at St John the Baptist Parish Church in Beeston, and the chapter we're going to be discussing this time is what happened about the statues. If you haven't read it, scuttle away and do so by all means. It runs from What an Extraordinary Place, Clyde, cried Lucy, and it ends at And Peter's tired army cheered and the newcomers roared and the enemy squealed and gibbered till the wood re-echoed with the din of that onset. Now the title of this chapter is quite striking, What Happened About the Statues. It sounds almost an afterthought, um, almost a, a sort of mopping up um, episode, and that's in fact how I've, I've heard it uh, described. I think there's quite a lot going on here though, symbolically. Um, there are a couple of sets of images which I think are operating in parallel here. Um, as I've mentioned previously, uh, Lewis seems to layer images and sort of tones of material onto each other, like the layering of um, Isaac and Edmund and Adam, or uh, like the layering of the girls with uh, the apostles of Gethsemane, but also the women in the garden and potentially also the women uh, at the anointing of Christ. So there seem to me to be to be two sets of things happening that both have to do with this question of what happened about the statues, almost uh, an afterthought, which then becomes part of the, the main line of the story. So um, I'd like to actually start by reading out that poem by Dunbar again that I, I read last episode, because I think it's absolutely packed with imagery that's going to be relevant in this chapter. So apologising again for my, uh, my bad reading of medieval Scots, uh, Dunbar's Sir exit dominus to sepulchro, uh, the Lord is risen from the tomb. Dun is a battle on the dragon black, our champion Christ confundet he his force. The yetis of hell are broken with a crack, the sign triumphal rasset is of the cross. The divils tremulous with hideous voss, the solace are borrow it and to the bliss can go. Christ with his blood our ransom es dois in dos, Sir exit dominus to sepulchro. Dungan is the deedly dragon Lucifer, the cruel serpent with the mortal stang, the old cane tiger with his teeth on char, whilkin await his lean for us so lang, thinking to grip us in his cloas strang. The merciful lord wild knocked that it was so, he mad him for to failure of that fang, so exit dominus de sepulchro. He that for us sake that suffer it to be slain, and like a lamb in sacrifice was dicht, is like a lion risen up again, and as an giant racks at him on hicht. Sprungen is aurora, radius and bricht, on loft is gone the glorious Apollo, the blissful day departed for the nicht, so exit dominus de sepulchro. The grit victor again is risen on hicht, that for our querel to the death was wounded. The sun that wax all pale now sheen is bricht, and darkness clare it, our faith is now refundit. The knell of mercy fra the hen is soondit, the Christian are deliverit are their woe. The Jowis and their error are confundit, so exit dominus to settle crow. The foe is chase it, the battle is done cease. The present brocken, the jewellers flare and flemmet. The ware is gone, confirmit is the pace. The fetter is loose it and the jungeon temmit. The ransom made, the prisoners redeem it. The failed is win, urcumen is the foe. Dispute it of the treasure that he yame it, so exit dominus de settle crow. And you can hear in, in those lines, there's all sorts of imagery, um, as I mentioned, that we can find in, uh, in the novel by Lewis. We can find the, the lion uh, and the giant uh, and the idea of the lion rising up again, uh, Aurora, the, the springtime springing all around us, uh, the sun appearing to be bright again after it was, it was waxed pale, the light coming out of the darkness, all those things we saw in the last chapter. Um, and there's mention of a giant, and of course we, we have a giant that, that rises up again uh, in this secret giant, Rumblebuffin, um, who combines this uh, strong and poetic um, sort of romance imagery uh, of a, a lion and a giant with this rather, I suppose, Bunyan-esque uh, down-home uh, English uh, dialect and with his, with his little handkerchief um, and his sort of politeness uh, to, uh, to the girls and to the lion. And that, that poem, with its talk of prisoners being let loose and the dungeons being opened and uh, the gates of hell being broken with a crack, um, seems to run all the way through this passage. Um, the, the, idea, the, 
idea that this is a, a liberation, but a liberation that involves finding the place where people are being kept and letting them free. Um, again, as, as I've said previously, I'm not suggesting that Lewis is turning Dunbar specifically uh, into prose here, although we know that he admired Dunbar enormously um, and that Dunbar was a very significant uh, poetic figure uh, in medieval literature uh, and one that, uh, that Lewis sort of commented on, um, certainly would have been familiar with. But that this is language that is part of the medieval Christian tradition, um, part of the, the long uh, tradition of, of thinking about the work of Christ, what the atonement was, what it achieved, how it should be understood. Uh, and this question of, of letting go prisoners uh, and of, of liberating is, is obviously both biblical language, but has also become mingled here, I think, with uh, as it is in Bunyan, with the, um, the romance language with questing knights, um, with terrible giants, um, and indeed good giants here, um, and with uh, dragons and dungeons, um, all that material that will, of course, later become Dungeons and Dragons, <laughs> a, a, a form of entertainment which Lewis and Tolkien both certainly influenced. Um, so we can, we can see here that language of the accomplishment uh, of the, the resurrection as breaking dungeons, opening things, and I was particularly interested that they specifically have to break down the gates uh, to the giant and has to do this. At the big, at the end of Beggar Pardon, of the last chapter, Aslan jumped into the castle and we have all this, um, there's this uh, courtyard stuff and all the uh, animals being brought alive again, but they can't get out. Um, they, the party of them need to all um, help in breaking down the, the door and we can find that. But how are we going to get out? For Aslan had got in by a jump and the gates were still locked. That'll be all right, said Aslan, and then rising on his hind legs, he bawled up at the giant. Hi, you up there, he roared. What's your name? Giant Rumblebuffin, if it please your honour, said the giant, once more touching his cap. Well then, giant Rumblebuffin, said Aslan, just get us out of this, will you? Certainly, your honour. It'll be a pleasure, said giant Rumblebuffin. Stand well away from the gates, all you litlands. And he strode to the gate himself, and bang, 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 went his huge club. The gates creaked at the first blow, cracked at the second, and shivered at the third. Then he tackled the towers on each side of them, and after a few minutes of crashing and thudding, both the towers and a good bit of the wall on each side went thundering down in a mass of hopeless rubble. And when the dust cleared, it was God, standing in that dry, grim, stony yard to see through the gap all the grass and waving trees and sparkling streams of the forest, and the blue hills beyond that and beyond them the sky. And, and here we go. We're back off into enchanted Britain again, aren't we? Um, <coughs> now, that made me pause, because... Obviously, there is there is this strong biblical language of of uh, liberation, um, you know, the year of jubilee, uh, the, the setting free of of prisoners, uh, and the establishment of uh, a just kingdom, and that is parlayed into uh, the evangelical tradition's uh, discussion of of uh, redemption as the the loosing of the bonds of sin, uh, of liberation of of the person, and indeed of of the uh, of the community. There's also, of course. Um, a set of medieval images that, that are possibly being played into here, specifically the harrowing of hell. Um, the idea that one of the things that Christ accomplished is to go down into hell, um, as, as the, the, the creed said, he descended into hell, and to um, liberate people there, including those uh, who had lived before the incarnation. Um, and specifically this language that we saw in Dunbar as well of, of specifically breaking the gates of hell and of, of Christ almost making a sort of military raid uh, on the underworld, as it's been expressed in, in various um, uh, theologies, the, the Christus Victor model of the atonement. And I wonder whether we're getting something of that. Um, and the more I thought about it, the more I was persuaded, because, of course, these are people who were uh, petrified and whose part in the, the war against the witch was apparently over before Aslan arrived. Um, they, it answers the question, what about all those poor creatures um, who got got um, before Aslan was around to help them? Which is one of the questions which the, the doctrine of the harrowing of hell, the story of the harrowing of hell, is formulated to explain. What about those who never had the chance um, of hearing about Christ? Um, so we have this, this very uh, physical, specific um, uh, martial imagery of the the breaking down of the of the castle walls, but to let people out rather than to let an invading army in, and that struck me again as as something which seems to be playing into this um, image of the harrowing of hell, that the the lion jumped in, but all the people need to come out through the gates, and so I think I don't think it's too fanciful um, to see this kind of of harrowing imagery going on here, and um, particularly as they then become an army and they go off and and join. Um, 
Peter's army with the war against the witch. But there's also, and I'm sure you've spotted this as well, there's also a different set of images, or should I say another set of images circulating here. Um, the way in which Aslan brings the stone animals back to life is very interesting. Hush, said Susan, Aslan's doing something. He was indeed. He had bounded up to the stone lion and breathed on him. Then without waiting a moment, he whisked around, almost as if he'd been a cat chasing its tail, and breathed also on the stone dwarf, which, as you remember, was standing a few feet from the lion with his back to it. Then he pounced on a tall stone dryad, which stood beyond the dwarf, turned rapidly aside to deal with a stone rabbit on his right, and rushed on to two centaurs. But at that moment, Lucy said, Oh, Susan, look, look at the lion. I expect you've seen someone put a lighted match to a bit of newspaper, which is propped up in a grate against an unlit fire. And for a second, nothing seems to have happened, and then you notice a tiny streak of flame creeping along the edge of the newspaper. It was like that now. For a second after Aslan had breathed upon him, the stone lion looked just the same. Then a tiny streak of gold began to run along his white marble back. Then it spread, and the colour seemed to lick all over him as the flame licks all over a bit of paper. Then, while his hindquarters were still obviously stone, the lion shook his mane, and all the heavy stone folds rippled into living hair. Um, and here we have Aslan going from uh, animal to animal, or statue to statue, and breathing on them, rather in the way that, certainly the way that he will breathe on Lucy in a later novel in Prince Caspian, which I so erroneously located in the previous chapter, Now You Are a Lioness, etc. Um, but I think in a, in a similar way to which the, the girl's able to feel his breath and his presence um, in the previous chapter. <clears throat> Pardon me. Now, it's, it's I think, very striking and, and unavoidable that Aslan brings people back to life by breathing on them. Um, we saw the, the parallel passage last chapter with, with Jesus um, breathing on the disciples and saying, receive ye um, the spirit of the Lord. And I think we have a Pentecostal scene here. I think that that's what's going on here, um, or that the, the images that are being reworked into this chapter come from Pentecost. Um, the combination of the breath and the fire um, the, you know, the, the spirit, the breathing, and the, the tongues of flame, the, the flame that licks along the body and, and um, revivifies it. And after you've had this, this breathing upon, you become on fire with life. Um, this is very familiar language of, of, um, of Pentecost and the, the receiving of the Holy Spirit. It also, I think, ties up with the effects um, of this uh, activity. It, Instead of all that deadly white, the courtyard was now a blaze of colours, glossy chestnut sides of centaurs, indigo horns of unicorns, dazzling plumage of birds, ready brown of foxes, dogs and satyrs, yellow stockings and crimson hoods of dwarves, and the beach girls in silver and the beach girls in fresh transparent green and the larch girls, so green, so bright it was almost yellow. And instead of the deadly silence, the whole place rang with the sound of happy roarings, brayings, yelpings, barkings, squealings, cooings, neighing, stampings, shouts, hurrahs, and songs and laughter. Oh, said Susan in a different tone. Look, I wonder, I mean, is it safe? And then we get on to the, um, the bringing back of the stone giant. Now, the first thing that made me think about that passage was its sort of copiousness. It's listing this and that and those and this and this and also that. Um, and then the, the tailing off into these very um, active verbs. Brayings, yelpings, barking, squealings, cooings, neighing, stampings, shouts, hurrahs and songs and laughter. That delight in copiousness in listing has a has a long tradition in literature i mean you can you can look at the list of ships um in homer um and i think homer is is interested in this kind of um profusion this kind of copiousness you know homer's uh, style of poetry is uh, revels in process and the everyday and the process of getting a dinner party together or you know cutting meat or making a ship or whatever um, and amongst it is, is this this delight in listing concrete details till they almost become an incantation. Um, but I associate it much more with medieval and Renaissance literature. Um, the, 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 the Erasmian copiousness, the delight in um, expansion. Lewis has, has written about this actually in his um, lectures on, on medieval and Renaissance literature. Uh, and I think it comes up as well in his uh, history of English literature in the 16th century. This delight in expansion um, in uh, profusion, um, I'm keeping keep coming back to this word copiousness because it seems to be the right word, which seems alien to the modern taste in literature. And, and he explains it in two different ways. At, at one point, he says it's um, 
it's a delight in scraps of learning. He, he wonders why they keep repeating uh, bits of knowledge that would seem obvious uh, to anyone and padding out poems like this. And it was at one point in my life, I thought this was just a question of um, there being very little learning around and a scrap of knowledge was worth putting in a poem. And later on, he said, I, I, think, I think I was wrong there. I think it's a stylistic question. I think it's something about the, the delight in the order and also the profusion of, of the universe. Um, if memory serves, he says that in the discarded image. But I may be wrong, it may be somewhere else. Um, and I think here we see uh, that, that delight in, in profusion. I think we see it a bit in Tolkien as well. And I was tempted to wonder whether, in fact, fantasy literature is the main place where this form of rhetoric, this rhetorical device, has, has a home these days. Um, I wonder whether it's sort of slightly become, I won't say ossified, I certainly don't say ossified or calcified, given what's happening in this uh, chapter. But I do wonder whether it's become a, a trope, a, a technique, a, a method um, to express something about the, the wonder of a world, a strange world, opening up in front of the, um, the protagonist. The thing that, that springs to mind immediately is the descriptions of feasts um, in J.K. Rowling's novels, um, which goes on about you know, they, this and that and that, and there was as much as you would want of this, and then there were second portions of that, um, which is often criticised for being you know, sort of trivial or infantile. But I wonder whether the, the sheer delight, there's something medieval or early modern about it, the sheer delight in, in copiousness and profusion. Now I say that, I'm reminded of a K.J. Parker novel. I'm, I think it's one of the Fencer trilogy, where a character goes down to the, um, the market and uh, looks at all the, the wares, all the things on offer. Um, and one of the things that they particularly focus on is, is the, the stationery stall, I think, um, and all the, the weights and pens and boards and things that the scribes can use. And there's a description of a, um, a book of letters, uh, sample letters that people can adapt. I've, I've got some of them myself, right? This is letter writer. Um, and it lists at, at great uh, delirious length all the different um, letters that you can send and all the different replies you can give to... Um, to uh, the people who are uh, sending you letters, um, a quite quite comic detail. So I wonder whether, just as a side note, I wonder whether this interest in, in profusion and, and listing has has only got one home left, um, and that's the, the fantasy world, and whether in fact it got that from the way in which Tolkien and Lewis distilled those literary influences from the from the medieval and early modern periods. Um, but anyway, whether or not that's the case, it's certainly here, and I think it also has another function, uh, a biblical reference here, because, of course, the courtyard is then, instead of full of deadly silence, the whole place rang with the sound of happy roarings, brayings, yelpings, barking, squealings, cooings, neighing, stamping, shouts, hurrahs, songs and laughter, as I've been saying. And those, of course, are different kinds of communication. They're not only noises, but they're the noises um, particular to uh, the, the talking animals. So brayings, roarings, cooings, uh, neighings, these are all the particular languages um, of these creatures. And so I think this, this underlines even more the Pentecostal quality of this um, passage, where by the end of it, everyone is speaking in their own tongue. You know, they've, they've been breathed upon by the lion's breath. And isn't it striking that the lion leaves immediately, breathes and then moves on, and that, that's part of the stuff about the, the fire. Um, that uh, it's it's as if someone's touched a, a match and nothing's happening and then the fire starts to come. This novel could be accused of having an underworked pneumatology, I think. Um, systematic theologians tell me that most of Western Christianity could be accused of having an underworked uh, pneumatology for, for the last hundreds of years. Um, and we might say that there's some, something getting mixed up here if the the Christ figure is present during Pentecost and that, that doesn't you know, quite give the, the weight to the third person of the Trinity we might want. But I think there's an echo there of that Pentecostal scene in that the lion, though still present, is leaving each individual person. This is not necessarily just a, a communion uh, with the second person of the Trinity, that, that he's leaving and it's almost like nothing's happened and then this flame starts to come out of the, the breathing. So I think there's very, very strong Pentecost imagery there. That also, incidentally, sent me off sideways because what does he say? I expect you've seen someone put a lighted match to a bit of newspaper which is propped up in a grate against an unlit fire, and just for a second nothing seems to have happened, and then you notice a tiny streak of flame creeping along the edge of the newspaper. It was like that now. Oh well, C.S. Lewis. Now I've set a lot of fires in my time using uh, newspaper fire lighters, improvised uh, fire lighters, and that's right, that is how the newspaper uh, catches light. 
It reminded me of something else, though, um, which I've read about in Victorian and Edwardian books, in that the fact that when you touch a flame to a newspaper, it looks like nothing's happened, was exploited as a trick um, played in London clubs um, upon the, the uh, elderly and crusty members uh, in the library uh, or the smoking room, where if you were a, a young, young chap, you would light your cigar and then walk out and just let the spill touch the bottom of, of one or two newspapers of the crustier older members on your way out. Uh, and because of that feature of newspaper, that it, it looks like it hasn't been lit and then suddenly it takes off, you can be in the bar uh, or in the billiard room or the other side of the room before this old uh, fellow with his um, top hat and his side whiskers is saying, well, you know, who, who's set fire to this? Why is my newspaper smoking? And, you know, he's, he's throwing it in the grate and, and um, hitting it with the fire irons. Um, so, yes, I... I I wonder whether Lewis is actually borrowing um, from elsewhere the fact that newspaper only starts to um, to take fire sometime after you set the match to it. Um, I, I wonder whether he's domesticating that uh, rather simply, saying, oh, isn't, it, "Isn't it just like laying a fire?" But anyway, either way, he's using that I think in a in a pneumatological sense. Um, the idea that the, the, nothing appears to have happened and the source of fire appears to be gone. But then that fire breaks out and it transforms the person and we can see the effect that the breathing that the spirit had upon the person and, and they're, you know, they're full of new life. And then they're, they're um, giving forth in their own language and they're with all these other people uh, and then they, they break out of, uh, out of the witch's castle. So as I say, um, and I've, I've run off in a few directions there, but I think there are two sets of potentially quite different images being brought together here, being laid onto each other. We've got these images of enclosure of, of you know dungeons and gates uh, and people being locked away and, and the lion having to jump in, in and then everyone having to get out and at the same time we've got this imagery of breath and fire and profusion of speech and different languages um, and actually what, what caught my attention what drew my attention to the possible layering of symbols here is that they don't quite sit simply together they, they seem to be, um, if not jarring, they just they don't seem to have any particular narrative link. Perhaps I'm being unfair there, but the, the reason why I, I sat down and thought about them was that there seemed to be almost two narrative, two plots going on in the same chapter. Um, so, yeah, I, I think he's I think he's done it again. <laughs> I think he's taken uh, different traditions, different uh, events, different narratives and brought them together into one very dramatic scene um, where they're there's their symbols can speak to each other, where I don't think we need to say this is the harrowing of hell or it is Pentecost, um, but it's what happened in that courtyard in Narnia and that um, it's enriched with those layers, with those different symbols operating within it. I said at the beginning that what happened about the statues seems a bit of a, a, a second order question. It seems a bit of an afterthought. Um, and I think both the, the question of the harrowing of hell and of Pentecost can feel sometimes like a second order question. The novel seems at some pains to insist that the passion has happened, the resurrection has happened, um, and yet things go on. Um, you know, Pentecost, the birthday of the church, um, the harrowing of hell, the, the, the formation of um, the redeemed community in, in, in time and space. And there are things for them to do, you know, that they don't just get up and neigh and stamp, they then break out of the castle and they go and join Peter's army. They go and join the um, uh, the, the war which is going on. They become the church militant, you know, the, the, the redeemed community um, goes and does things. It, it acts as a body. Um, and I wonder whether the, the novel here is, is careful not to end simply at the resurrection and say, oh, that was it, that solved everything, um, game over but to, to show the formation of the, the, um, the holy nation, the redeemed community, the, um, uh, the gathered people, the, the, those who are uh, breathed upon and, and set aflame. Um, and, you know, there, there is more plot to happen still, obviously. Um, but, yeah, I, I was particularly struck where this chapter almost advertises itself as, a, as an afterthought and then makes it very clear this is not afterthought. Um, after all... This novel, like all fantasy novels, is going to have to explain how it relates to our world. Now, that can be literally in that, you know, spoilers, um, the Pevensies find their way out of Narnia back into our world. Or metaphorically, where some sort of catharsis takes place for the reader or the, re the character that the reader might identify with undergoes some change, particularly in young adult fantasy. There's often a sense at the end of... Um, 
and, and what now? You know, what what life can I lead having read this book? You know, where does this book send me off? Um, and I think the the invocations of the harrowing and of Pentecost here contribute to that, contribute to the sense of, of sending forth. So that, as I say, running in several different directions at the same time is what I thought about this chapter. And I'd be very interested to hear what you thought about it. Um, the next chapter we're going to be talking about is chapter 17, The Hunting of the White Stag. Um, stag, I'm going to flag that up from the very first chapter. You know I'm going to be going on smugly about how the fact that I noticed that stag um, all the way at the other end of the book. Um, but that chapter begins, the battle was all over a few minutes after their arrival, and it runs to, but if the professor was right, it was the only beginning of the adventures of Narnia. I look forward to discussing that with you.